I used to be preaching in the Philippines, and it would be 100 degrees, and I'd say, boy, if we could only get this worship in the cool weather. <laughs> and we got it, didn't we? we got it. Thank you so much. Worthy is the Lamb. What a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. God has brought us together from all over the world to, to share in his love and his grace today and to enjoy the power of the resurrection in our lives. Thank you. We'll have to have that again. You know, we have another big event on June 9th. It's Pentecost Sunday. <laughs> and, and I think we should be prepared to celebrate. Amen. You know what I'd love to see happen here? I'd love to see each per each person sing Amazing Grace in their own language, all come up, you know, at some time together. Wouldn't it be neat? Praise the Lord, a song that's common around the world. Thank you, Lord. Well, I guess I have to go to work. I've really, really, really been enjoying the morning. And the children earlier, wasn't that beautiful as well? Thank you, Lord. Romans chapter 8 and verses 10 and 11. Maybe you can get the offering later. We have a good crowd here today. Let us not forget the offering. <laughs> and an honest pastor. But, but for you. But for you who welcomed him. And who he dwelt. Did the Sunday school go down? But for you who welcome him in whom he dwells, even though you still experience all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. That's what I want to talk about, life on God's terms. I want to talk about life on God's terms. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead, moves into your life. He'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bringing you alive to himself. He'll do the same thing to you. He'll do the same thing. I pray that we can get this across by the presence of God today. When God lives and breathes in you, when God lives and breathes in you, and he does, as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life. With his spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as Christ. Isn't that a great verse? <laughs> Jesus first announced... Where's, is Bob here? At that end is where all that... Can you shut that off? Yeah, that's where all the radio is coming from. When Jesus first announced his resurrection in Caesarea Philippi, when, when Peter had said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus had responded in Mark 8, and verse 31. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed. And after three days... See how he responded? Way back in Caesarea Philippi, he said, after three days, rise again. Yeah. You know, sometimes, I don't know if you ever experience this or not, but I expect you do, sometimes we struggle with the words that God tells us. We hear them, but our minds do not process them because they are different from what we normally hear, what we're normally hearing. Now, did you ever have somebody talk to you about something and you totally missed it, missed it entirely? Maybe it was your wife. <laughs> How many ever had something like that happen? <laughs> Jesus said back in Caesarea Philippi, he said this, the Son of Man is going to be, go up and be crucified and the third day he's going to rise again. They didn't get it. They missed it entirely. They didn't get what was going to happen, even though he said it. Shortly after this event, Mark records, they went up on what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. 
And there he was transfigured in front of them and his countenance shone. And, and Moses and Elijah showed up. Now, we had a tremendous service this morning, but Moses and Elijah, I didn't see them. <laughs> but you can imagine Jesus shining and Moses and Elijah showing up. Now, that, that's a big event, isn't it? Wouldn't you say that's a big event? And, and, and Jesus mentions the resurrection again. And in Mark chapter 9 and verses 9 and 10, he said, As they were coming back down the mountain, he admonished them and expressly ordered them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man should rise from the dead, until, until Jesus would rise again. So they carefully, listen to this, and faithfully kept the matter to themselves. Look at the next line. It says, questioning and disputing with one another about what rising from among the dead meant. So the first time he said it, they missed it entirely. And the second time Jesus said it, it became a point to be discussed. It became, you know, when, when you first start reading the Bible, you want a lot of good arguments. It has it's not in your heart yet, but you have a lot of good arguments. You have a lot of good discussions. It's a mental thing. It's in your head. And so he said, second time he said, I'm going to rise from the dead. So it said they kept it faithfully, but they, they discussed it. He didn't really, what did he really say there? They, they had all kinds of discussions about what Jesus said, just like sometimes the church does. There, when the word of God, hear me on this one, this is really important. When the word of God goes into your head and not your heart, it becomes a matter to be debated, but not lived. Amen. That's really worth thinking about. When the word of God goes into your head and not your heart, it becomes a nice discussion, but not something you're, you're living, not something that's coming out of the inside of who you are. You're not, you're not walking in it. There are all kinds of truths in the Bible that we discuss, but we don't walk in. The disciples heard what he said, but their minds couldn't process it. Listen, here's, here's, here's how you know that. Here's what their response was on that first Easter Sunday morning in Luke chapter 24, verses 10 to 11. And it, it, was, it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James, and other women with them, who reported these things to the apostles. They, they came back and they said to the apostles, Jesus is alive. But these reports seemed to the men an idle tale, madness things nonsense and, and they did not they did not believe the women now Jesus had told it and they missed it Jesus had told it again and they discussed it and now the women come back from the tomb and said it happened and they said mm, don't think so I can't see it can't see that happening the human mind not under the control Boy, this is valuable. The human mind not under the control of the Holy Spirit seems to have no ability to grasp spiritual things. Amen. Now that's a very big thing to say, isn't it? We are so used to things going the way of the unregenerate world, the way of the unsaved mindset that we do not accept when redeemed things actually happen among us. We are so used to that unsaved mindset. The Bible describes the response of the women when the angel reminded them what Jesus said beforehand in Luke 24 and verses 6 to 10. The angel said, the angel shining, <laughs> glowing. You can imagine meeting somebody and they light up. So they, and this guy was shining. He, he said to the women, he isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember? Remember? Remember what he told you back in Galilee that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified? And he would rise again on the third day. And they remember a guy shining, lit up, 
standing by an empty tomb says, remember? <laughs> and they remember. They remember that he had said this, so they rushed back from the tomb to tell the 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. They, they, they were starting to get it. They were starting to get it. Looking at an empty grave and seeing somebody that shines, tell them to remember, they started to get it. But they didn't get it well enough to convince anyone else. Now that's an interesting concept too. They had the concept that Jesus was alive, but they didn't have it in their heart well enough that they could that, that it would make sense to anybody they told it to. There's a level of knowing something is true, that it is sound enough to be able to, to talk about, but not able to convince somebody that you really mean what you say, that it's real. Look what it tells us about Lot in the Old Testament. I, I want to prove this point. In Genesis 19 and verse 14, it said, the angels said to Lot, they said, we're going to, we're going to destroy this city. If you want anyone alive, get them out of here. And Lot went and spoke to his son-in-laws, who were to marry his daughters, and said, Up, oh, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But look what it says. But he seemed to his son-in-laws to be only joking. Couldn't be. You know why? Lot wasn't living the kind of life that would convince you that what he said was true when he talked about the coming destruction on the city because he had too much invested in the city. That's what was going on. And so you can believe something, but not believe it well enough to, to live in it, not believe it well enough to operate in it, not believe it well enough that you can convince somebody else that what you're telling them is true. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 4 and verse 2. But the word of the report did not profit them, not having become mixed together with faith in the case of those who heard. So the word, the word didn't work because it wasn't preached with faith. There wasn't any, I deeply believe this conviction in what they were saying. He said it didn't profit anything because it wasn't mixed with faith. This is where, this is where, this is where the Holy Spirit makes a difference. The Holy Spirit, that same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, dwells in us. Hallelujah. He dwells in us. He lives in us. He lives in us. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 10, but for you who welcome him, you who welcome him, in whom he dwells, even though, even though you still experience all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. What a thing to do, to experience life on God's, God's terms. Becoming a Christian is not the matter of me presenting something to you and you saying, yeah, I accept that. I give mental acceptance to that. That, that is something that, uh, in my mind, I, I, I think you're right, John. Being a Christian is more than a... It's welcoming, welcoming the presence of Jesus. Yes. The presence of Jesus into your life, into your heart. You know who... It says welcome him. It doesn't say welcome it, right? Amen. In whom he dwells. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 6 and 7. The God who said... The God who said... Let there be light in the darkness has made this light shine in our hearts. Has made this light shine. You know what happened? He's comparing it to creation. He said, when the world was without form and void, the darkness was upon the face of the deep. God spoke. And you know, our hearts were without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God spoke, not to our head, but to our heart. Guess what happened? He rewired us. He changed the nature of the heart. Dr. Novak talked about how the heart has a brain in it. And God rewired the brain in my heart. He said, I'll put a new heart in you. I'll take out the heart of stone, and I'll put in a soft gentle, kind heart in you. Paul, Paul says, 
he has he has made this light shine in our hearts so we so we could know so we could know you know this morning this morning as the children as a as a worship team as a, the group from the other side of the world that now live among us as we all worship we felt a, a little light of the glory of God. Amen. Just a little, just beginning to shine in our life. I, I, I stood at my seat and I felt that light shining in my heart. And I, 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 I want to put God on the rightful throne today where he belongs. I, I, you know, that light wants to shine. You know, when everything in your household goes wrong, God wants to shine a light in your heart. Somebody last week, I was counseling somebody and they're struggling in their marriage in a huge way. And I said, get a word from God for your marriage. You get words from God for everything else going on, your business and everything else going on. Get one for your marriage today. Let the light of God shine in your heart and illuminate who you are. And he said, shines in our heart so we would could know, so we could experience the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ and now we have this light shining in our hearts we have this light shining in our hearts you know you know what goes on in my life I say this to my wife my way down when somebody does me wrong I put my brain to work when somebody does me good I put my heart to work but I need to get it switched I need to get it switched so when somebody does me wrong my heart takes over what a wonderful thing, the light shining in my heart. And, and all of a sudden, I'm not responding like the old carnal guy. I'm responding like the new guy. The disciples didn't have that when they walked with Jesus. He hadn't breathed on them because they weren't redeemed, yet the cross hadn't happened. Dr. Novak told us that the heart has the ability to talk to the brain. The heart specialist came to our church and he told us, what Jesus told us. Yes. You know, when, whenever Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled, I thought, now Jesus is mixed up again. <laughs> he meant brain. But I was mixed up. Yes. Our brain runs our body until we let the heart take over. Out of the abundance of the heart. You know what St. Paul said? If thou wilt believe in thine heart, that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with and out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. And that's what causes you to get saved, because it's speaking out of what the heart has taken in. Isn't that a great thing? And so the disciples didn't know that. The Hebrews said, uh, see where I am here. Oh yeah. We just read that Paul says, now we have this light shining in our hearts, not our brains. This is what he says, Paul says about our minds. In Romans 8 and 7, he said, this is because the mind of the flesh, with its carnal thoughts and purposes, is hostile to God. Oh, you know what I do? You know what I do? When somebody wrongs me and my mind starts saying, okay, John, you know how to fix that guy. You know what I do? I say, shut up, John. You know why I say that? That's not a very nice thing. You teach your kids not to say that word, but I got to be rough with me because I'm a tough guy. I say, shut up, John. You're, that never got you anywhere. Shut that thing off because that thing is going to kill you. The, the natural mind is hostile to God, not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. But our text goes on to tell us in Romans 8 and 11, it stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead, if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in your heart, the alive and present God that raised Jesus from the dead lives in your heart, present in your life he'll do the same thing he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus bringing you alive to himself your heart now under the control of the Holy Spirit jumps to life your heart jumps to life you know what happens when you come to the cross your heart all of a sudden responds to God the Word of God and it jumps it comes to life and it says wow I found something in Jesus Christ 
that's real. It, it, it begins to take over. Even though the mind, Paul says, is under the same limitations of sin that it always was, when you let the Holy Spirit control your heart, it causes the mortal body, Paul said, it causes the mortal body to be quickened. You get a rush out of it. That's why we Pentecostal people are nuts. <laughs> because the heart does something big. It, it, clicks, it clicks with the Word of God. It comes to light. And guess what? It gives you a rush. It does. Have you ever got a rush from the Holy Spirit? You know, I, you know something? I got off Space Mountain in Disney World disappointed. <laughs> My wife and I went to Disney World. And, and we got on Space Mountain and we went for, you know, whoo, what a drive. <laughs> We're on our honeymoon. And I got off with it and I said, man, I had so much better times in the presence of God. That's just a joke. <laughs> I was disappointed with Space Mountain. Now, you, you, the reason being is the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. It lives right there. It lives right in me. Hallelujah. And so... Uh, listen to what, how Paul describes it. In Romans 8 and 11, when God lives and breathes in you, and he does as sure, surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead light. With his spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as Christ. There's a rush, St. Paul is saying. But this, oh, I have to say it, this is where I differ with the Pentecostals. Oh, it's quiet. <laughs> you know where I differ? I don't just come to church for a rush. You know, you know electricity is a wonderful thing. It's shocking. <laughs> electricity is a wonderful thing. And if you grab a wire, it'll shock you. And you know, oh, hallelujah, I, I've been shocked. Wonderful thing. But guess what? When you hook that electricity up to a, a drill or a table saw, it'll work for you. You know, I can stand all day and hang on to the end of an electric cord and say, boy, I'm getting a rush out of this. But, but I'd be better off if I hooked it to the table saw and cut something. And you know, you can come to church and say, Oh, I had goosebumps all over me. Whoa, boy. And then fight with your husband on the way home. Because <laughs> you've got to get more than a rush out of God. You've got to get something real down your heart. You know why? You know why Jesus was transfigured on the mount? You know why he lit up? The holy presence of God came on that man, Christ Jesus, and lit him up. But the cross was only a few weeks away. And you know something? He could have said, oh, Peter said, well, Peter was Pentecostal. <laughs> he said, we're all getting a rush up here, Jesus. We should build a tent and stay. That's where tent meetings started. <laughs> we're all getting a rush. We love it. And Jesus said, no, we're going down over the hill. We're going to cast the devil out of a, young, out of a man's son. <coughs> Because we got wired up here, but we're going to take it to the real world yeah. and make it work for us. Being a Christian is more than a rush. Being a Christian, I like it. I like it. When, when, when you guys get up here and dance, I put my hands up. I, I get plugged into God. I could dance too if I wasn't so old. <laughs> my heart dances. Hallelujah. And, and, and I, I feel real good on the inside. Boy, I, I just say, woo, this is great. Let them little girls dance all day and I'll just dance back here kind of in my heart. We'll all get happy. And then Monday morning comes. What in the name of God happens? <laughs> I'm going back and watch them dance some more. <laughs> but I will tell you something. I came here to dance so I could go out there and reach a re touch a real world that disagrees with me and everything I say. And, and, and I have to keep going. I don't know. Oh, my soul, I think... You know, I set that to not shut off for five minutes, and I must have spent five minutes out there. Did you notice how quick the time went? Elect okay. In Romans 8 and 14 and 15, or 14 to 17, he said, God's spirit beckoned. There are things to do and places to go. 
He said, the Holy Spirit's here. The resurrection light you receive from God is not timid, grave-tending light. It's adventurously expectant. See that word? It's adventurously expectant. Greeting God with a child like, what's next, Papa? God's spirit touches our spirit, confirms who we really are, and we know who he is, and we know who we are, father and children. And we know we are going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. We got it all figured that God's got an unbelievable inheritance for us. You know why Jesus was transfigured? Because he was on his way to the cross. God doesn't empower you just to get a Russian church. We are empowered to face a real world and win. In Romans 8 and 17, we know we go through, we go through exactly what Christ goes through. That's quite a thing, it's cross-like. If we go through the hard times with him, then we're certainly going to go through the good times with him. Amen. The power of God in your life is not here to change your environment. It's here to change your attitude toward your environment. Yes. Yes. Amen. What a wonderful thing. If the same, my old grandmother used to sing, if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, dwell in you. Did you know that song? If, you know, she never got to the Philippines. <laughs> If the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, dwell in you. If the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, dwell in you. Oh, the Sunday school kids are going to take over. Yeah. 